Hello and welcome to another episode of Two Guys in a Chainsaw. I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. So today we are going back to something that uh, I've been wanting to do for a very long time, especially when I heard that Craig had never seen this before. This is 1958's Horror of Dracula. The original title was Dracula, but it got changed to Horror of Dracula in order to avoid copyright issues uh, with Universal's Dracula in the United States. But this is Hammer Horror Film Production, starring Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing, one of the most iconic duos in Dracula history, and definitely the movie that put Hammer Films on the map. Hammer Horror, I I don't know, I kind of liken this to um, Freddy Krueger and New Line. You know, mm-hmm. Hammer, um, you know, was making some horror films here and there. Before this one, Christopher Lee and Peter Cushing were in uh, Curse of Frankenstein, which was a bit of a hit for them. But it it was this movie, The Horror of Dracula, that was an international hit. It made like 25 or $28 million worldwide in 1958. Pretty much set the tone for uh, uh, it bankrolled the studio. All, this and all of these subsequent Dracula movies that they that they released, I think... There were seven or eight after this that Peter Cushing and um, Christopher Lee or some combination thereof basically felt obligated to do (laughs) for Hammer. And Christopher Lee himself, I think one of the most recognizable, I think he's played Dracula, I think it still stands that he's played Dracula more times than any other actor ever has, at least in the movies. And uh, he even did Dracula for other studios, so it wasn't just the Hammer series that he played Dracula. He, he got quite sick of it, didn't want to be typecast in this role. In fact, my understanding is that he didn't really even like playing Dracula in these movies because he didn't, he didn't really think that their version of Dracula was very true to the novel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, for a guy whose popularity really grew and burst forth on this sort of thing... I don't think he ever came out and, you know, was openly disdainful of it, but uh, he definitely, it was well known he wasn't too keen after a while on playing this character much more. However, put an iconic performance in as Dracula. As much as you can say an iconic performance, he really isn't in the movie all that much and he doesn't have a lot to do. (laughs) And I think you can say that about the subsequent movies too. But I would almost argue that Dracula is kind of like that. The only other time we've done the Dracula story, which was Blackula, right? Yeah. And it wasn't until we saw Blackula that I think I I realized the obvious, I guess, that Dracula as a movie, as a story, is kind of a drama. The play, the movies, every time I've ever seen the, the original Dracula story, it's all, you know, he comes out at night and he does mysterious things but then during the day he's asleep in a coffin so you know all of these shows are like uh oh no somebody's been bitten can we save them now uh what do we do we talk about it for a while we investigate we try to figure out where he is or where he might strike next we maybe set up some traps then night comes and he does something and they almost get him or he kind of gets away and then the morning is and then we're subjected to more talking and investigating and discussing and you know it's like most of it ends up being that kind of thing. It's not your zombie movie, action-packed kind of story. Yeah. Traditionally. And so this movie's really no different. But it was very different from the Universal Dracula that came out. And I think that is one thing that really appealed to people in 1958. Because before that, they had the, of course, the Dracula novel. And then the wildly popular mm, play from which the Universal movie, the Dracula movie from the 30s, was based on. And most of the Dracula adaptations actually ended up getting based on the play, which was based on the novel. And I think this is one of the first movies of its time anyway that said, let's go back to the source material, shake things up a little bit from that play. So you don't have it all sort of happening in the same area. It's not all the same four characters. Renfield's not even in this at all. Right. It even puts it in Germany. (laughs) Like the whole movie is in Germany, which is interesting. And I think they did that for budgetary reasons or just to kind of simplify things on the production end. So here we have the horror of Dracula. And personally, from my perspective, this was the first Dracula movie I ever saw. And I saw it on TV. I think it was probably a Saturday morning. And it made a deep impression on me. One or two scenes that I really remember the most, obviously, are the scenes where Dracula attacks. But the ending of the movie where Dracula dissolves once he's exposed to the light and the whole fight scene that happens there was just permanently impressed upon my brain as a kid. (laughs) And it was one of those things that even as an adult, I always go back to as something that really freaked me out, really scared me, really 
really stuck with me over the years. I don't know if anybody watching it today is going to have the same feelings that I had when I was a kid watching this for the first time. But maybe kids today watching this for the first time. I don't know. It's just, it's a different movie in a different time period. But uh, I was so happy to revisit it after not having seen it pretty much since that time. So how about you, Craig? I guess you had never seen this before, right? Or do you remember maybe catching a glimpse of it or two as a kid? No, I mean, I've seen images from it. And in all of the like retrospectives and documentaries that I've watched about classic horror monster movies, it's always discussed. Um, but I had never seen it. it. Being a big fan of horror in general, I remember reading the novel in high school and like being surprisingly underwhelmed by it. Yeah, me too. A hundred percent. Here I'm thinking, you know, it's Dracula. That's that's awesome. You know, like the 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 iconic vampire story, and then it's this epistolary novel that's all told through like letters and journals, Diaries and, and news journals. clippings, and <laughs> like I don't know. I mean, it's just it's it's really not very exciting. And ultimately, that's how I felt about this movie too. Like. Uh, I get it, like, but I know the story of Dracula. In fact, I know it better than this movie seems to. That, that's not fair, because I understand that for budgetary reasons, and even just simple, you know, f- for the sake of time, you know, for the sake of time, you can't include all of the characters and all of the subplots and relationships, of which there are a lot, in the novel, you can't include all of that, but this, the story just felt uh, kind of watered down, and and I can't help but compare it to the only Dracula that I am really familiar with, which is Bram Stoker's Dracula, and and Bram Stoker, the movie, right? That um, Francis Ford Coppola did in the nineties, right? Right. It was just it was done really well. It was sexy and Dracula was really scary and like some of the things that they eliminated from this for budgetary reasons like any notion of Dracula's shape-shifting abilities and that types of stuff like it's it's vaguely mentioned another thing I always understood that if there were such things they could change themselves into bats or wolves (sighs) that's a common fallacy Homer The study of these creatures has been my life's work. I've carried out research with some of the greatest authorities in Europe, and yet we've only just scratched the surface. You see, a great deal is known about the vampire bat, but details of these reanimated bodies of the dead, the undead, as we call them, are so obscure that many biologists will not believe they exist. Dracula is only in the movie for seven minutes. In that seven minutes, he only has 16 lines. Those are all at the very, very beginning. The rest of the time, he just grunts and snarls at people. And he just shows up every once in a while to walk into a woman's room. Like, <laughs> like, that's, <laughs> like that's it. That's the role. But isn't just, that... Just walk into a woman's room and look kind of menacing, kind of sexy. But to, to be fair, isn't that basically Dracula? I mean, isn't that kind of like... I mean, every Dracula we've ever seen on the screen, not, not you know, vampires. We're talking Dracula, Dracula, right? That, yeah. pre- that pretends to be based on Bram Stoker's novel. I mean, like, Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula was trying really, really hard. and, and It was. You know, they, they had, like, reincarnation and flashbacks and speculative material in there. Try, you know, a lot of the super sexy sort of orgiastic lesbian scenes and things like that. I mean, it was really trying to go over the top. And I think you could argue took its own liberties right on the Bram Stoker novel in order to, to be that. So sure. I wouldn't necessarily say it was a more faithful adaptation, although it pretended to be, I guess maybe it just has something to do with the fact that I saw it when I was in high school and it was really sexy. And well, it was, there's no question about that. And I don't know if I'd say it was scary, but it definitely had its scary moments with, um, was it Anthony Hopkins? Is that who, who was it that played Dracula? Gary Oldman. He played the younger Dracula, but I don't remember if they just put him in super old makeup or if there was another actor that played him as an older guy. I don't remember, but like the shadows stretching across the wall, the almost, I don't know. I really liked that movie. And so, 
watching this one, you know, I was thinking, I was thinking, my dad probably saw this in the theater on a Saturday afternoon for a nickel and probably loved it. <laughs> You're probably right. Or Todd saw it on a Saturday afternoon after Saturday morning cartoons and also loved it. Yeah. By comparison, just based on the time period in which it was made compared to today, it's just, it's really, really tame. Yeah. F- frankly, I just, I was, was kind of bored. I, I, I did appreciate, you know, it, it's cool to see Peter Cushing and, uh, these these other guys who I know are are horror icons and 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 rightfully so and I respect that and having seen them and other things you know particularly more contemporary things I mean both these main guys were in the Star Wars films which I was a huge fan of as a kid and so they're really familiar and there's comfort in that familiarity but just as far as uh, the movie itself goes. I don't know. Like even the yeah. the characters, the characters that I wanted to be invested in. Like I, I um, in the novel, and it's been so long, but um, I remember being particularly invested in the characters of um, Lucy and Mina, knowing that they were both constantly threatened and at risk i was really into that and like i just i just didn't get that from this i didn't particularly care <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like beat them up i, I don't care <laughs> well it's it's hard right it's hard to know i mean at, for me maybe you don't feel this way but for me i'm just i'm so familiar with the dracula story there's no tension there anymore right you know? there's right. no mystery and so this movie that's again, I, I and I, I felt the same way about Blackula, really. The only thing that kind of kept me interested in Blackula was like, you know, how have they kind of switched it up? Yeah, but ultimately, I think we both agreed the story was just Dracula, the Dracula story, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. which is just that we all know it and it's kind of boring, really. I mean, the idea of it is pretty freaky, but if it's like a mystery where you already know the plot. You're just going to sit there and um, and watch unfold what you expect to unfold. And so the movie's trying really hard to make it a mystery, but it's following the same result that you always get. So I, I, I was trying to look at it like I was trying to watch this movie like, what if I didn't know the Dracula story and I was seeing this movie for the first time? How well constructed is the story? How are the beats? How are the reveals? Like as a mystery, as a these guys trying to figure out what's happening. And I just tried to put myself in that frame of mind when I watched it. But you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, nobody I think who right now is familiar with the story is going to be very interested in this. And even the Dracula story, I will again say, I still think the Dracula story itself is rather boring. The novel is rather boring. I was also disappointed by the novel. It wasn't at all what I expected. But, you know, I mean, it's obviously had some resonance for a very long time. Oh, yeah. Um, it, it is kind of, at its core, it's a scary concept, right? This creature, yeah. this person who's was a person once, but presumably, but is now just a shell of that and almost unrecognizable, clearly doesn't like the, the torment that they've been confined to for the rest of their lives as an immortal creature, just sort of... Like, just to, to live. Actually, I think it was Christopher Lee who th- felt this way about the novel and was, like, trying to imbue this in the character of the movie, where this guy, like, he's got some humanity there, but it's long gone. You know, there may be glimmers right. of it, but right now, like, he doesn't care. Like, he just doesn't even want to be living anymore. He's just going through the motions of, of life, but he's not happy about it at all. And I, And there's some distance there, you know? There's some... I think maybe some of that is what makes it a little hard to get behind him as anything other than just this monster that goes out and gets people, right? Um, right. You can have sympathy in the idea of what he has become, but now here's who he is, and so you watch this character on the screen, and it just seems rather flat. I don't... Does that make sense? I don't yeah, know. it does make sense, and, you know, I think that Dracula, as written by Bram Stoker, you know, I think that they're... And I'm, I'm not in any way really like formally educated about this kind of stuff so don't cite me in your research paper or anything but like there have, there's been lore of vampiric creatures forever um but i think that kind of the way that in pop culture we've defined 
vampires is very much based on Dracula. And um, the, the sensual and seductive nature of vampires, I think, comes largely from this. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, you know, Dracula, while obviously a threat, I mean, he's, he's, he's going to kill you and or potentially turn you into this, you know, undead creature that has to feed on human blood. So there's definitely that that dark, um, you know, occult kind of uh, element to it. But he's also like a Mac, you know, like the, yeah, the, the, right. the, the, you know, all women swoon. Uh-huh, over him, all you know? women swoon. You know, they are they are more than happy to surrender themselves. Um, even in this movie, you know. It, the one woman, Mina, is a married woman who immediately succumbs to the seduction and hides it from her husband and, and uh, everybody else initially until she's found out. But it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's clearly, there, there's a sexual element to it. And I almost feel like in the 1950s, this was a way to get away with some overt sexuality. Oh yeah. Without making it too graphically sexual. Like right. I I know that at one point uh the woman who plays I don't remember if it was the woman who plays Lucy or Mina, but um the the director after her encounter with Dracula, she wasn't sure of how she should behave in the aftermath it was mina yeah and, and and the director said just act like you've just had the best sex of your entire life and it lasted all night long <laughs> 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 and you know i that's appealing <laughs> <laughs> right so so there are elements of it the, the elements are there it's just in sitting down and watching the whole thing, as you well know, I am not drawn to film from this era. And by nature, just because of the dynamics of cinema at the time, it was pushing the envelope, I think, for the time. But yes. but, but not compared anymore. to what we're used to, I mean, you could show this to a kindergarten class I mean, that, that's an exaggeration there there is some violence and blood and gore a little bit but it, it's it's very very mild yeah and what isn't mild what is sort of sexual is going to go right over their heads right it's it's not yeah. it's not that graphic i mean i'm happy with what we're doing i really have no interest in going beat by beat through this movie i don't know if you do it, it's no, basically it's the dracula, dracula story <laughs> but, so, so i'm so happy to skip around but when you bring up the sexuality like the women in this movie are gorgeous Mm-hmm. as is typical for the time. You know, they have that certain makeup. They have that certain sort of bombshell style. Starlet. Yeah. Like... Starlet. Yeah. And and they're wearing, um, again, nowadays we wouldn't think these are racy type outfits, but I would say about half the time, if not most of the time, Lucy is in her night clothes and they're flowy and her boobs are perky, you know, she's got a beautiful hairstyle and makeup and everything like that. And I mean, that doesn't even go unnoticed by, you know, 40 something year old Todd today. But that scene where, you know, she opens, um, it's kind of cute. I mean, we all know the story, but like, you know, they, that Lucy's is feeling a little sick and they're not sure what's wrong with her. Van Helsing leaves or, or the doctor leaves or whatever. And they close the door and, and it's nighttime and she's going to bed and instantly she gets up and she opens the window which are basically the doors to her room, to let Dracula in. And she just goes and she opens the window. She's super excited. She's got that hungry look on her face, you know? Yeah. And she goes and she just, she lays down in bed like, here I am, come take me. Oh, right. You and, know, and that totally communicates, <laughs> even in 2022. I thought that yeah. was pretty hot. <laughs> oh, God. Well, sure. I mean, and it's so old Hollywood. You know, her hair... You know, spread out on the pillow, at one arm above her head, you know, like... Yeah, she's... but also the look on her face is just, you know, it's like she's waiting for her Tinder date. Like, she just oh, knows what to expect. And, I, I mean, it's 
it's nice. I, I have to say, I, I like that bit of this. Um, and and you know, I think that Bella Lugosi loved to brag and talk about how the vampire is sexy and I'm a sexy vampire. But I don't get that from the Universal Dracula. You know what I mean? Right. I don't really buy that he's that sexy, even for his time. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it either. And I, for for a second, when you were talking about it, I I was mixing it up with Nosferatu, which is. A completely different thing. Which is more scary than this movie, honestly, I think. Well, uh, just he's just more monstrous. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. like he's he's clearly a, a monster. I mean, this Christopher Lee, uh, you know, not my type, but I mean, he's striking. Like he, he is a, a very he's very tall, super tall. He has a very striking face. He has a very commanding presence. And so. I'm not surprised that he played Dracula as often as he did. In addition to all of his other iconic roles, of which there are many, mm. um, I understand why. He he has an amazing presence as a man, as an actor. Um, Peter Cushing, too, you know, uh, an excellent presence, but he, these two guys, they, they, they make excellent foils for each other. I, I think Peter Cushing is is more every man, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so it it makes sense for him to be the good guy. Now, something that I didn't, I don't remember. I don't remember the novel well enough. But Jonathan Harker is is a major character in the book, if I remember correctly, and he gets offed right away. In yeah. this, he he's also comes. I mean, there's kind of a bit of a twist, kind of a reveal. He comes to the castle Dracula as Dracula's like uh, he he's hired him to come and catalog all his books in his library. Is there anything else you require, Mister Harker? No, I don't think so. You've been very kind. On the contrary, it is entirely my privilege. I consider myself fortunate to have found such a distinguished scholar to act as my librarian. I like quiet and seclusion. This house, I think, offers that. Then we are both satisfied. An admirable arrangement. Yeah, but it's a ruse, right? It like, is. Isn't, yeah. He's there. Uh, uh, Van Helsing has sent him there. Like, mm -hmm. they, they, they like know who Dracula is. Yeah. But then uh, there, there's only one bride. She's not even referred to in the credits as bride. She's just a vampire woman. But... In the original story and in most iterations, uh, Dracula has three brides, but there's only one here. And, you know, she's uh, a beautiful woman, too, um, and, sh and she's right in the very beginning. But she takes out Jonathan right away and turns him into a vampire, and then Van Helsing has to come and, and kill him. And then the... Right? Yeah, I, yeah. I really liked this about the movie, though. I thought that more than, like, this was kind of a cool fake out. Again, I was trying to look at it with fresh eyes. And so I was trying to put everything I know about Dracula aside and watch it. And I liked the idea that we know that he's in peril. And we know this woman, woman is shady. and But he seems kind of drawn to her. And he's very kind and everything to Dracula. It's the same deal. He shows up, right? And Dracula says, I'm sorry. I can't, you know, he's just, there's a note. I'm sorry I can't be with you. Enjoy this food, blah, 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 blah. The woman comes up to him. I'm the new librarian. You will help me, won't you? Say you will. Please. How can I help you? Get me away from here. But why? He's keeping me prisoner. Who is? Count Dracula? I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, please. Please, help me to escape. And she has to run away because Dracula, you know, makes his appearance. And, oh, I'm sorry, you know, blah, blah, blah. Let me take you to your room. And then he locks him in the room, which is, you know, kind of terrifying. And then he sits down to unpack his things. And he writes, starts writing in his diary. So we get a voiceover. And, I mean, you're thinking this whole time, well, he's the victim, right? He's going to be a victim here. All these things, he doesn't understand what's going on. And then in his diary, he writes, He accepts me as a man who has agreed to work among his books as I intended. It only remains for me now to await the daylight hours. 
God's help, I will forever end this man's reign of terror. And you realize, oh, he knows exactly what he's jumping into. He's not an idiot. He's here to actually take care of business. And I thought that was a nice twist. I don't remember that for many of the other movies, taking that tact. And I don't think the novel has him as coming in knowing. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so. I don't remember what his errand is there, but mm-hmm. I, I, I think that he slowly figures out what's going on. He doesn't already know going in. And I was just, I was surprised because being familiar with the story i expected him to be the protagonist and mm. so i was so you know here i am every di- every time i do this I, I i'm sitting in front of two computers i've got the one that i'm watching the movie on i've got one on the other side of me with you know imdb open i'm looking at the cast and i see that the guy who plays jonathan john van eisen is billed below like six or seven other people i'm like well that's Weird. I'm like, I, I, I thought I, I get why Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee get top billing. That that makes sense to me. But I thought it was weird that he was listed so low, and then he gets killed off right away. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, well, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> right. But yeah, I, I mean, I if if I remember correctly in the, in the source material, it's he, he has a romantic relationship with one of those women. I think that he is uh, engaged to Mina like I don't know I honestly Mm, yeah you're right it's something like that high school was a really long time ago yeah that's the problem really yeah I really don't remember but I don't remember this uh character of Arthur Holmwood at all I I I I liked that he was played by Michael Go I think G-O-U-G-H for me kind of the definitive Alfred from uh Tim Burton's Batman movies yeah um and uh you know it was cool to see him he doesn't really have a whole lot to do i mean that's kind of the thing there's not a whole lot of plotting you know the you know dracula kills jonathan but jonathan had already killed his bride so so dracula comes after um jonathan had a photograph of Mina, I think it was Mina, or was it Lucy. Lucy? Yeah, Lucy, who he was engaged to, yes. Okay, he had a photograph of Lucy who he um, was engaged to, and Dracula had taken interest in it right away. And when Van Helsing comes to look for Jonathan and finds him dead, and ha- well, a vampire, and has to stake him, he also notices that that photograph of Lucy is gone. And then... Dracula comes for Lucy, I guess, because he was she was connected to Jonathan and Jonathan stole his bride, so now he's gonna claim Lucy um as as his new bride. Which he does, but then she turns into a vampire, starts prowling around, and she lures her niece or I don't know, mm-hmm. a little girl that lives in their house. <laughs> yeah, it's the it's the daughter of the of Goethe, the the maid, the I housekeeper. Think, right? Okay, mm-hmm. so she lures her out, and then um, I still don't get it. Like, are Arthur and me? They all have the same last name. There's Arthur Holmwood, Mina Holmwood. Arthur and Mina are 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 married, and um, Lucy is Lucy. Arthur's sister. Okay, all right. Uh-huh. So he finds Lucy messing with this little girl. I mean, before she bites her or anything. And then she gets scared away. Does, does, uh. Van Helsing pops in. And, and, and he, he burns her with a cross, like on mm-hmm. her forehead or something, right? And yeah. So she and- runs off to her tomb. And then they have to kill her, you know, like, and that, the, the staking of Lucy is, um, I don't know, iconic's not the right word, but it's very classic, staking her right in the heart and her screaming at being staked. And There's some blood. There's some blood. I liked that part. That that was good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's more like the idea of everything, more than the actual presentation of it, is more terrifying, right? This poor mm-hmm. Arthur, you know, his sister, he's reluctant to stake her. Like, even though all the evidence is there, even though he's seen she's come back to life, all this stuff, 
Van Helsing is like, no, um, we can use her to, I'm sorry, he's not reluctant to stake her. He's reluctant to, to let her live as a creature anymore because Van Helsing's idea is, look, we can use her to lure Dracula. Right, or or she can she can lead us to him. Mm-hmm. And so we can finally take care of this guy. And he's like, no, 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 no. I I can't let her live as a creature like this anymore. And so he leaves it to Van Helsing to stake her, which you know is very upsetting to him. But then when Dracula, then okay, so Lucy's gone. So now what does he do? He turns to Mina, Arthur's wife, and um, seduces her while. They're still looking for Dracula. They're out and about on their errands. Um, one of the places they go, um, because because they kept all this in Germany, and I think they, I, I read they did it for budgetary reasons, so yeah. it wasn't have to be like, you know, the boat trip and different locations and things like that. They kept it all in Germany. So when Van Helsing went to Castle Dracula looking for Harker, one of the first things he saw was a hearse galloping at full speed yes. out of there with Dracula's coffin in it. So Dracula was on his way out. But Van Helsing saw that he left. So Van Helsing knows that that coffin, you know, took a trip. And so he talks to, you know, they, they go on their little investigation like, well, they would have to have crossed the border here, which means that they would have had to pass through this border crossing, which means that there would be a record of that cargo, which we can check and see where it went to. So then they go to this border crossing place and they find that it's like sort of the little comic relief bit, I think, of the movie where there's this goofy border crossing guy who's being silly and, and whatnot. And uh, they bribe him, and eventually he tells them that, you know, he went to this and this place. While they're out doing all this investigation is when um, Dracula is seducing Mina. Yeah, he sends her a, a note, mm-hmm. and it, it's it's a lie. I mean, it's purportedly from her husband, but it's not. It's him. Meet me here. And- yeah, to this particular address. And as it turns out, it's the same address that they get for where Dracula's coffin. But yeah, sadly too late, late, right? It's it's right. it's a mortician's place or whatever, right? A, a funeral home. And the director of the funeral home, which um which unfortunately um Van Helsing and Arthur only visit like a day late, a day late basically after Mina was there. Yeah. This guy is another goofy dude, and he tells some joke when they're walking down the steps. Perhaps you better let me lead the way. I know these steps, they can be dangerous. <laughs> we don't want to have an accident, do we? <laughs> no, we, we don't. <laughs> you know, an old man came here once to see his dear departed, and he fell down these stairs. <laughs> it was quite amusing. He, he came to pay his last respect, and he remained to share them. <laughs> <laughs> and he happens to be the same actor as was in Dead of Night, playing that that guy who was the hearse driver who says, room for one more, sir. Oh, oh, that's funny. Isn't that funny? So he plays like a mortician in both of these. It's kind of cute. That's right. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> um, I did feel like there were moments, and, and they were few and far between, but there were moments where they were kind of going for comedy. And again, I think that it's just a generational divide. Like, it's I was just like, dated. ha ha, like, <laughs> not funny. Um, right, <laughs> but, but when, uh, so, I don't know, the next time they see Mina, the housekeeper comes downstairs and she's like oh she wasn't in her room she went out the night before i assume she came back but she's not back well then she shows up immediately and of course she's glowing too like Mm. (laughs) (laughs) right she looks like like, she looks like she just got it good Um, (laughs) but but she's so she's so obviously wearing this high collared like fur muff like you know like (laughs) she's hiding it she's hiding yeah she's hiding it it's funny Uh, it's cute but also you're right her glow is unmistakable and there's, again, it's this dirty kind of adultery thing, like this uh-huh. bored housewife kind of thing, right? Uh-huh. Like like Arthur's clearly a pretty boring, straightforward guy, and they've clearly been together a while, and she's just not getting it. But she has this little affair with Dracula, and now she's just like a changed woman in more ways than one. And you see it on her face. And that and the Lucy thing, I thought, read, I think, still read really well today. Yeah. I really do. It, yeah. It was... It was pretty sexy. <laughs> it's true. It's true. And they are very beautiful women. And so to see them, you know, playing up kind of that sultry nature of it, like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's good. But they figure out right away that she's a vampire. One of them tries to give her a cross for protection, but when he hands it to her, drops it in her hand, she screams and faints, and they look, and it's it's burned 
a cross into her hand. So they know that she's a vampire now. And something that I thought was kind of funny was that Arthur at that point's like, darn it, I should have let you use Lucy. I'm so stupid. And then he's basically over it. <laughs> like well, his sister in a, in a matter of a couple of days both of his, both his sister and his wife have been killed by this vampire and he 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 kind of just takes it in stride. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's no longer reluctant like there he's willing now to use her as bait. Right, he wasn't willing to lose use Lucy as bait because the idea was so horrible. Then now that he's seen it's happened again to his wife, then now that he's willing to you you know he's come to his senses. He's like, all right, and so you know they sit outside and wait. They're looking for Dracula. They think he's going to come in through the window or something. So they're camping out outside in the bushes waiting for him. And somehow Dracula appears in the freaking house mm-hmm. and gets her and. All they hear is, you know, they walk inside, there's a scream, they see that she's been attacked again, and they're like, how in the hell did he get in the house? She's kind of on death's door, and they, they, he says to the housekeeper, please go get some, get some wine, she, we need some wine, blah, blah, well, blah. They, they do a blood first, transfusion. They do a blood That's transfusion. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love the, by the way, with, I love... With no explanation, <laughs> like, you just see them doing it. Like, yeah. oh, I mean, I, this is how you fix it if somebody turns into a vampire, Look, apparently. it's a... It's a full-on scene, and, I mean, it's kind of unnecessary, right? Like, we didn't need to see so much of it, but it's the whole thing. Like, they're both connected by these tubes. Van Helsing goes over. He goes through this whole rigmarole, like, actually probably pretty accurate of, like, you know, the the um, housekeeper's got the, the alcohol there, and he uses his hand to swab it and, like, pulls the needle out and pats him down and checks it. It's okay, all right? Uh-huh. Then he goes over to her. He does the exact same thing to her. It's like... It's like a five or six minute long scene that is nothing more. It it doesn't it really advance the plot. It's no. nothing more than just showing that they did a blood transfusion and he was medically accurate. <laughs> right. <laughs> Through all of it. He knows what he's doing. Cause and, and you never see her again. Like I I assume she's just okay. Yeah. Because right, the uh, Van Helsing is like, okay. Guy, you need to drink a lot of fluids, water or coffee or, oh, better yet, wine. Drink a lot of wine. And so somebody tells the housekeeper to go down in the basement and she's like, oh, no, I'm not going down there. The last time I disobeyed the mistress's orders or your something like. Yeah, it, it was earlier. Like she was the one um, Van Helsing when he investigated Lucy, um, you know, he saw the marks on her neck and he told Mina, he he said, "Look, you just need to follow my instructions if you want her to live. You got to put this garlic flowers around there. You got to keep the windows closed, all that stuff." And so then she communicates that to the maid, of course. But Lucy, of course, when she wakes up in the middle of the night, is disturbed by all the garlic, and she gets the maid in there. And the maid's like, "Okay, fine, I'll take away the flowers." Oh, can you open the window? Oh, I'm not supposed to, you know, open the window. Oh, but but it's stifling. Oh, okay, I'll open the window for you. So right. she's feeling guilty that she basically caused Lucy's demise by disobeying yeah. Mina's orders. So this time around, she's not going to do it. Mina told her not to go into the cellar under any circumstances. So she's not going to do it. And Van Helsing's like, what? Yeah. (laughs) So he immediately runs to the cellar. And of course, there's a coffin down there. So Dracula's coffin has been in the house the entire time. Yeah. And the minute he finds the empty coffin, he looks up. The door opens. The Dracula just pops in and snarls. (laughs) And then Uh leaves. Like he's trying to return to his coffin because he's got to be in his coffin with the earth, right? Right. By, By sunrise. But uh, Van Helsing is down there. And that's what leads into our big chase, our big chase right. sequence. Actually, I really liked that bit, too. I thought it was like this sudden revelation, and suddenly things got exciting again. And, you know, it's like this whole deal. And so he's chasing him around the the place and up across, uh, back to his castle. Because right, he takes, Dracula takes Mina in a horse-drawn carriage i I guess all all of the horse-drawn carriages in this movie are like authentic to the you know time period some guy had like a whole collection of them and they used them whatever that looks cool but he takes dracula takes mina and is headed back to his place and so the men are in pursuit and then there's a gag where dracula like runs his horse cart through like a roadblock 
Mm. And the guy at the roadblock is like, darn you. And then he's just fixed it when the other two guys come through and run through it and bust it all up again, too. Like, yeah. It's just so weird to just throw in this little bit of slapstick comedy right, here and right. there. Uh, and, and, and especially here, I mean, this is the climax of, uh, the movie and it, it really just, I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't take long. So it's not like it slows things down, but it's, it's kind of a break in the dramatic tension. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't even really know what Dracula's end game is here because he gets back to his house and he throws Mina in a grave, like just her, she's conscious he just throws her whole body into a grave and starts to bury her. He's trying to hide her from them, I think. But but she's he's essentially burying her alive, isn't he? Yeah, I, I maybe that's a thing they do. I don't know. But Van Helsing chases him inside, and they fight. And there's a little bit of a fight, but it doesn't go on for very long at all. No. I mean, what can he do, really? You know. Yeah, I, mean, I get. And there's no talk. There's no dialogue. There's like no witty villain banter or anything <laughs> like that. Van Helsing pulls down the curtains, and the sun has come up, so the sun streams in. And then, arguably, this was my favorite part of the movie because um, there's some really cool effects where, starting with his hands, which are the first thing that gets touched by the sunlight, he just starts to disintegrate, like mm-hmm. uh, almost like dry out and and his his flesh becomes papery and and kind mm-hmm. of dusty dusty and kind of peels and flakes away um and then eventually it the sun falls on his entire body and all of that happens and i read about how they did some of it they put like um coroner's wax or something on christopher lee's face and kind of peeled it away I don't remember it. It sounded very technical and cool, and and it looks. <laughs> I mean, it looks old. It, you know, it it, it doesn't look yeah. real. It looks like old effects, but they're practical, and uh, it definitely gets the point across. And I liked the look of it. But then, if I remember correctly, like my my notes just end. In fact, it looks like I started to type something and just stopped. I don't even know. Like that's it, right? Like it's just over. Yeah, yeah. It just it's like a, the 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 final scene is like the it's like his hand. Uh, is the last little bit remaining, and it's just kind of dust and blows away and just leaves the ring that was on his finger right there. Which, uh, this was the scene when I was a kid that struck with me. Yeah, I can see why. It's definitely the most exciting scene in the movie, right? It's definitely the most effect. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool little sequence. It doesn't, it's not going to blow anybody away by modern no. standards, you know, but uh, yeah, it's it's gory for its time. Not It's not bloody, but it's, you know. Right. It's gross. Graphic. Mm-hmm. Graphic. Yeah, exactly. I, I, you know, I, I thought that was fitting it, and kind of cool. It, like, it could have just, you know, the light comes on him. It, he, he just completely disintegrated. But it's like, no, yeah. like his hand is in there. And then, like, he's trying to come out and fight with one hand. And, you know, then he kind of gets pushed back into it. it. It's cool. It's a neat sequence. Yeah. Blackula ends in much the same way. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's about 20 years later. And so the effects look. About 20 years better. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty much the same ending. They get him in the light, and he disintegrates, and the end. Yeah, I mean, I get it. I, I understand that it is, you know, considered a, a classic as much as any Hammer films are. And, and I don't mean that with any disrespect. I feel like the Hammer films... Their purpose was um, to entertain. You know, these are not necessarily high art. These are um, matinee flicks uh, targeted a a specific audience. And um, I think that probably at the time, I can understand why it was very successful, probably especially with young people would be my guess. Um, uh, It just... So for that reason, as I've said a bazillion times, I'm 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 happy to have seen it. You know, it's in my lexicon now. I can talk about it, but uh, it didn't. I mean, it didn't do anything for me. I I, I was I was glad when it was over. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think this is something that like a family with mixed ages probably all kind of enjoy for different reasons personally, but I don't think you're right. I don't think by modern standards it's going to blow away anybody, but it's sort of like if you examine it in the time that it was done, you're right. You can see how it was a bit groundbreaking. Even the castle, Harker in the beginning, opens the door to his castle and walks in, 
And it's kind of been modernized. I mean, it's still a castle, but it, the walls are not like brick, dusty, with tapestries everywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, like the Universal Dracula is like a cobwebby. You know, his his, his sure. castle is like an old cobwebby, you know, brick, kind of cold-looking place. Like yeah. this looks like, uh, once he walks in there, it's almost like a modern mansion. That, right. You know, like a repurposed castle. I thought that was kind of cool. Like it actually had these sort of 60s type vibes to it. You know, and that modernized it a little bit. The blood and the gore, which you didn't see in the previous adaptations, that modernized it a little bit. You know, Christopher Lee jumps out. One of his first appearances as Dracula is a close-up on his face. He's got these huge fangs. And that is iconic. I have seen that image everywhere. You know, I've I've seen that image on T-shirts. And, you know, he's got the fangs, which I, I guess was fairly new to Mm -hmm. vampire films like they hadn't had the i I, there i read trivia that said some people claim that this is the first film that used the elongated films when actually that's not really true but it was one of the first ones Mm -hmm. and he does he has these elongated uh canines or whatever they are and and you know the blood on his lips and on his teeth and of course it's that Technicolor bright red blood, and yeah. um, he's wearing um, contacts that make his eyes look otherworldly. Yeah, that image is is fantastic. It is, and I think that's another thing that modern vampire movies. That's the thing that freaks me out the most: the eyes. You know, modern vampire movies always play around with the eyes a little bit. They'll give them hugely dilated pupils, or like in the Lost Boys, they have those sort of like silvery gray eyes with the big pupils or whatever like that. That's what really starts to get creepy more than the fangs, I think. And I think this was the first movie to say to do that. And he, his eyes, they just look yellow and bloodshot and crazy. It was more overt for the time on the sexual stuff. You know, in the same regard with the gore, there's more blood in it, but not nearly as much blood as you get in a vampire movie today. Right. Certainly tame. But also, I just... I've seen a lot of of the subsequent films, and uh, I don't remember any of them because they all run together. But th- like I said, there were like seven of them. We watched, I think it was their last Dracula movie, right? Yeah. The seven... Oh, no, it was Franken's. Oh, yeah, we did watch that one. What was yeah. it? The, the... Samurais or Samurai, the Dracula and the Seven Golden Vampires, the Seven Golden Vampires and something like that, which was their mashup with the Chinese one. That was interesting. I mean, Christopher Lee isn't even in it anymore because he was done, but Peter Cushing is in it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there were seven other movies, I think, uh, the Dracula movies, but this this duo of Peter Cushing and Christopher Lee... It extended through most of the Dracula movies, but also into a lot of other movies. There were 24 movies that these two were starred together in. Like, I love these two guys. And for what it's worth, I think that Christopher Lee in this role, I'm I'm not going to say he was the best Dracula ever. He's the Dracula that just based on my circumstance and my childhood is most burned in my memory and made the deepest impression just because he was probably the most prevalent the one i could see the most but also he is pretty good Mm -hmm. he's super tall and he has this strength in the movie he's just lifting these people up like they're nothing Mm -hmm. he comes out and he is very menacing in that in those fangs and those eyes and all that stuff and he's got that deep resonant voice and i think the first thing that i noticed as an adult as i'm analyzing this is that he's very detached like you know like disinterested right yeah He's not witty and clever and things. He's just very businesslike and almost not even there. Yes. And I think that was a conscious choice. Yeah. And I don't remember the novel. I I I I I remember the the Gary Oldman movie and in that Dracula was very much a character. Yes. Like he he definitely had personality and motivation mm. and yes, he was seductive and and this may just have been the adaptation i don't remember how much of it is faithful to the book but like he seemed to long for these women it was more than just bloodlust it Mm. was uh there was something more to it and and you know he, he he had dialogue and and interaction with um the characters, yeah. which is lacking here. I mean, well, he... It's even in the play. 
Dracula barely talks at all, and the only stuff that he t- do- is like business, like oh, like uh, here's your bedroom, uh, help yourself to some food. Like it's not, it's yeah. not anything substantial. Yeah, uh, and and I miss that. I I would prefer a more character driven retelling, but it is what it is. Yeah. It's a classic monster movie, and that's fine for for what it is. Well, I, I think this was a very clear choice that he made, and, and he s- spoke about it. He he was like, this is a guy whose humanity is long gone. He's just going through the motions of life right now, and, and that's his tragedy. And so he chose to play Dracula that way. And for what it's worth, I think the Dracula of the Hammer Horror films was just a monster. You yeah, know, like yeah, that. Yeah, fair enough. So, you know, it's it's a different take on Dracula, but as that, it's I think it's effective. But you're right. I, I'm totally with you. It's not as interesting. <laughs> mm-hmm. Especially now when we expect a little more depth out of our villains, right? Yeah. In in all genres. So um, we, we want to be able to relate to them more. We want to see them as tragic figures. And in this, it's very hard to see him in any other way. Right. right? And then just a guy who's going around biting people. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, thank you again for listening to our show. If you enjoyed it, please uh, share it with a friend. You can find us online, twoguys.red40net.com. Two Guys in a Chainsaw podcast on your favorite search engine, and you'll find our Twitter feed, our Facebook page. Leave us a message on any one of these social media platforms or directly on our website. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, we would love your support. Check out our Patreon. You can find us at patreon.com slash chainsaw podcast or go to our website and uh, click a link there. If you throw a few bucks our way, we have some nice added um, bonuses for you. We got some exclusive content, some extra interviews, um, unedited versions of of what you just heard, and a few other little surprises here and there. So um, please uh, consider. Until next time, I'm Todd. And I'm Craig. With two guys and a chainsaw. Chainsaw.